Good evening, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming. As you can see on the side, my name is Owen Murphy, and I'm going to talk to you this evening about the conservation of ground nesting birds. So I suppose a small little bit of background of myself. I work in the conservation sector, and I fulfil various contracts, um, ecological contracts, mainly dealing with the suite of birds that we're going to be talking about, which are ground nesting birds. Um, some of the contracts that I fulfil, or most of them, are for the National Parks and Wildlife Service, and they're generally based in the Midlands. Uh, Largely, my, my main ones would be on Loch Ree and the Mid Shannon Callows, so that would be the area that I would be focus, fo focusing on uh, mainly. But ground nesting birds, as a rule in Ireland, are doing particularly badly. We all know that there's biodiversity challenges in Ireland at the minute, and our you know ecological status can, can be fairly poor. But ground nesting birds, uh, by their nature, are, are vulnerable to certain pressures, and it seems to be in Ireland at the minute that a lot of these pressures are all coinciding. It's nearly like well, some larger than others, but it's nearly like um, death by a thousand cuts. Do you know, no matter what way they turn, they seem to be under pressure. So we're going to go through some of the pressures and some of the, the um, suite of measures that, that we try to implement to protect these birds. So I suppose to start off with just what conservation is, which mostly you're probably aware of, is, is technically it's the preservation, protection and restoration of the, of the natural environment and of the wildlife. So, I mean, that's what we're trying to do in, in instances that we have fairly decent populations of birds that we think are under pressure, we're trying to hang on to them. And in other areas, we're trying to restore habitat so they're, they, you know, they become suitable for these birds, again, maybe after deterioration after a number of years. Um, so the restoration and then the protection, there's various different things that we implement in order to try and protect these birds. Generally, in Ireland, a lot of these birds do relatively well as adults. So, they're, so for their adult's life, um, their mortality rate annually would be very, very acceptable. These birds, such as currently, would that they will come back to the same um, areas year after year, and they can be long-lived, a lot of these birds. So with a curlew, I mean, curlew could be coming back to the same breeding grounds for 30 plus years, um, certainly well, into, well over 20, uh, wouldn't be unusual. And so the adult rate of survival is fairly high, but the rate of survival of their chicks and their nests is very low. Um, and over time, uh, it has deteriorated and deteriorated. And some of these are in substantial decline. Um, the curlew as a species would have a decline of over 90%, well over 90%, 97, 90, even 98% in Ireland since the 1980s. So, I mean, they're, they're under huge pressure. Um, I suppose from a conservation point of view, we've all heard there's loads of different Irish conservation projects um, on at the minute, uh, some of them would deal with various different species, so there would be single species conservation programs. Um, so corncrake is one, and I think we've seen in the paper recently that the corncrake um, life project is actually doing fairly well. I think that they, you know they've had a slight increase in their corncrake population, which is great to see. Um, there's hen harrier um, are, are part of a, an EIP. Curlew has a curlew conservation program, which has. Uh, wound up this year after six years. Um, there is obviously other conservation projects as well for, for non-avians, you know, such as natter deck toad and whatever. And there's also then Irish reintroduction programs. So in, in areas that birds or species would have been lost entirely, so that, I mean, extinct is the word that a lot of people use, but it's extinct um, would be a global term. So, um, th you know, they would be extinct from Ireland as species, would be white-tailed sea eagles, uh, red kites and there's an osprey project uh, going to start this summer and they will be releasing reintroducing some ospreys into them so these are these are sort of the the, the things that we do in order to try and uh, raise awareness i suppose as one but two is to restore populations that are under pressure um, and obviously there's various conservation groups so national parks and wildlife service is obviously a, a government body that uh, deals with all these things. Birdwatch Ireland is, is probably one of the, the main uh, non-governmental organisations, but you have a suite of other ones, Irish Peatland Conservation Council, the Nate Woodland Trust, Bat Conservation Ireland, the Irish Whale and Dolphin Trust. So I mean, there, there's loads and loads of them and they deal, they deal with, I mean, nearly everything, uh, you know, all, all different uh, forms of um, ecology. Uh, Burn the Old Trust, and we have our national parks then, of course, that are, uh, their primary uh, purpose of the Irish National Parks is to protect um, biodiversity um, and their, their secondary role, I suppose, is, is visitors and getting people out. So, I mean, they have a dual, a dual focus, but the primary purpose is to protect 
uh, areas of, of wilderness and, and natural areas that, that are left. Um, and there's a bios biosphere reserves, uh, one in Kerry and one in Dublin Bay. So um, these projects, I suppose, by and large, are, are funded either from the EU or through the Department of Agriculture would be a big funder of, of uh, some of these programs, and also the NPWS. Um, so you would have life projects which are EU funded. So corn Craig life, there's Macare life, which deals with, with Macare, which is a type of um, uh, habitat found in sand dunes or found near the, near the coast that, that isn't that um, isn't that common. Uh, Ireland and, and some of Scotland are, are some of the few places that have Macare, so that they're, they're part of a life project. And then there's EIPs, which are European initiative projects um, or partnerships like Farm Peat, which is one that's uh, how farming interacts with, with our peatlands and with our bogs. There's a Hen Harrier EIP, um, which is trying to protect breeding Hen Harriers in, in their ranges. There's per, the Pearl Mussel Project is another one that people would have heard of. Um, and our other ones then are, are, are Department of Agriculture funded ones like Acres, which would have started out um, probably as reps uh, many years ago and then would have changed to uh, gloss and whatever, but the new, the new uh, reincarnation of it is acres. So that will be dealing with trying to protect um, certain areas of high nature value and that are also been farmed, or getting farmers to farm in a more uh, nature friendly way. And um, so there, I mean, acres is a very very big budget uh, project. Um, and then there's NPWS farm plans as well, which are. Can be very valuable they're more focused they're like um individual farm plans for individual farmers so as opposed to the department of agriculture schemes which would be blanket measures over big areas the mpws farm plans are sort of bespoke so if you had somebody in an area that had some high nature value habitat on their farm uh, they can draw up farm plans and they will get paid uh, like acres they will get paid uh, per hectare for measures that they implement to protect these uh, these habitats. Uh, so here we see a pair of curlew out on, uh, I think that was, that was Inch Boffin out on Lockery. Um, so conservation as it is, like anything in this life, there's loads and loads of different ideas on how conservation should be done and how it works best and what should happen. Um, and it, 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 I suppose it, it depends on what species you're trying to protect, the ha or habitat you're trying to protect, and the budget that you have. Um, a lot of projects are probably running on shoestring uh, budgets, so there's only so many things that you can implement. Uh, you have to cut your cloth to your measure. So um, they, are, they are some of the things, but the intense management, I suppose, is one of them. Uh, there are plenty of people and I suppose it is true, if you have enough money and you have enough personnel and you do things right and you can intensively manage areas um, and really get habitat to whatever level that you want to or you can control certain species and, you know, in favour of other species, etc, etc. But it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of manpower and it takes a lot of effort. Um, in, in some ways, you know what I mean, it, it's, it's very good. In others, I mean, there, there would be mixed ideas of, say, a managed grouse moor in Scotland, which I suppose would be one of the most traditional intensely managed areas and if we take out which which a lot of the grouse moors in scotland now are trying to take out the persecution of raptors out of it so traditionally they would have wanted no um, species present that would affect their grouse numbers so obviously hen harriers all those species of raptor would have been gone as would have foxes stoats uh, anything basically that would eat grouse or eat grouse's eggs uh, etc. So it would be very, very in intensely managed. Um, as it is at the minute, some of them are trying to reverse that and just protect from, I suppose, uh, ground predators. Um, they're, you know, vowing not to interfere with hen harriers and these sort of things. And, you know, in a, in a very intensely managed situation like that, I suppose it is nearly proven that, like, currently we're doing very well on some of these grouse mowers uh, and some of the waders because they're not subject to the same nesting pressures as they would be if the grouse more wasn't intensely managed. So I mean, that's one that's open for debate. Some people have different ideas about it, but um, it just it, it does sort of prove that intensely intense management of an area and um, the reduction in predator numbers will benefit ground nesting birds in a lot of situations. Um, and I suppose the direct opposite to intensely managing something is the idea of rewilding, which is 
a term that has sort of come to prevalence over the last five, I suppose, five to ten years. Um, not a term that I'm overly keen about. I think it's sort of a lazy argument because of the fact, right, if you leave everything alone, if we're really wild and you will go back and eventually in time, you will get back to sort of a balanced ecosystem. But if we think about it rationally, it's never going to happen on a big enough scale. So we're never going to get hundreds of thousands of acres in Ireland that's left alone to rewild. You will get small little pockets if, if somebody's a big landowner and chooses to rewild a couple of hundred acres or, you know, but it, it, by and large, it's never going to happen to a large extent. So to say that you want to rewild something or say that, you know, you have an idea that this should be the way something would happen when it's never going to happen is sort of a lazy argument in my, in my opinion. So um, with no management of any description and everything is just left to, to, to balance itself. So I suppose most of Irish conservation projects would be somewhere in the middle of these two things. They would neither be highly intensive nor would they, would they have no human interventions. So you're trying to get that balance that you, you have budget to do human interventions that are most meaningful, I suppose, is, is what we're trying to achieve. Um, national parks, I suppose, are one that's, that are sort of in between. I mean, they're fairly intensely managed because they have a lot of visitors, they have a lot of people in and out. So you would have parking and you would have toilets and you would have facilities for them, as well as trying to look after your ecosystems and your whatever. So you have ground staff um, and you have a certain amount of... Um, you know, pruning of bushes and trees and removing of scrub and whatever else for walkways and whatever, but you will have other areas then that are sort of left more natural. Um, farm plans are another one that are sort of in between. The, the farmer is still going to farm the land. Uh, the farm plan then is what trying to tweak his methodologies or, or in, in some of the rare instances, get him or he or him or her, I should say, to, to remain doing what they're doing. If, if their areas are very high nature value, they're obviously doing something right. So you're trying to incentivize them instead of maybe intensifying, um, you're incentivizing them to stay farming at you know a, a, a lower intensity, but you're going to increase their income. So the potential uh, that they might get from removing hedgerows and reseeding on you know nice naturally wild grassland with um, <coughs> with with other with other things. Uh, you're removing that incentive. You're trying to give them the amount, the, the money, um, to justify being able to farm in that more traditional way. There's a tough to duck. Um, my own opinion, I suppose, I, I lie somewhere in between. There's soft techniques that I like. I suppose that's why I'm here this evening. I think education is the key. Um, some of us, like myself, I suppose that you know you're getting into your forties or whatever. It's probably too late for some of us. Um, so we really need to be hitting the. The younger generation hard. I mean, when you when you talk to somebody who's fifty and been doing something all their life in a certain way, it is hard to get them to change. Um, if children, I suppose, grow up through a schooling system appreciating nature and appreciating the fact that our biodiversity is meaningful and that it has um, benefits for society in general, um, it has to be a good thing. Public engagement is another thing. Uh, generally, you know, whether it's from a forestry or a farming or a fishing or a, or a you know a gardening point of view or, or um, a governmental organization people don't generally go out with the purpose of causing biodiversity loss or eliminating a species or whatever an awful lot of it is done um through a lack of knowledge so if you can increase the knowledge and you increase your awareness about well if you do these things um you are going to have an impact a negative impact on the biodiversity such as maybe draining uh, a small area of wetland. You know, somebody might have a pocket of land, a landowner that it, to them it doesn't look very productive and says, oh, I'm not going to dig some drains and I'd run that into it. You remove a whole vast array of, of, um, of a lot of species that aren't that already visible because it's sort of a bottom up thing with conservation. If you can get your very, the bottom of the, of the pyramid or the food web right, which are your, in, which are your plants, I suppose, and your, in, and your invertebrates. Everything else, you know, sort of bounces back from that. But when you remove a lot of these uh, insects and stuff, um, it affects everything all the way up along. So, um, and there's other hard techniques then that, that I, I, I believe in and that, that we do, uh, we certainly implement in most of our conservation projects. And these would be habitat works. So in, in a lot of cases, they are um, bringing in machinery or, you know, fencing or doing certain things like that that will allow habitat to recover. Um, in, other, in other conservation measures, you know, some of the woodland technique, they would be out physically planting trees. Um, sort of the, the inverse of that is that on Loch Ree, on some of the islands in Loch Ree that are, that are valuable for breeding and ground nesting birds, you're actually getting scrub 
um, developing on the islands, which isn't good. So the islands are always trying to revert back to woodland. Um, a lot of the species that we'll, that we'll talk briefly about in this don't like that. They like big open areas, whether it's bogland or whether it's open meadow. So when you get scrub encroachment, it actually reduces the, the availability um, of the habitat that they're looking for. So in some instances, you're removing scrub. In other, one, in other instances, you're, you're, you know, you're encouraging it, depending on what you're doing. And predator management is another one that, that um, causes, a, causes some controversy. Um, it's sort of a proven fact, I suppose, if, if from even conservation measures in areas such as New Zealand that would have had a lot of flightless birds um, and there would have a lot of invasive species, so they had cats and rats that wouldn't have been in New Zealand and that would have decimated these populations. They have The only way that they can get these populations to recover is by removing the invasive species. So I suppose in Ireland, our, our big one uh, from a mammalian point of view would be American mink. American mink shouldn't be here, they shouldn't be in our ecosystem. So the like of that, that's a predation management and they they are captured and they are euthanized. So that causes a lot of problems for some people, especially, I suppose, we're all here talking about it because we're nature lovers, um, as I would be. Um, but I would still remove mink from Loch Ree, um on a continuous basis year after year. And we have done so for over 15 years um, on Loch Ree. And I mean, as a result, the ground nesting birds on Loch Ree are in a, a, a far more favor, favorable position than they are in the vast majority of the rest of the country. And what would your opinion be on the pine marten in relation to ground nesting birds? Yeah, well, I mean, pine marten, any, any mammalian predator will have a negative effect on, on, or has potential to have a negative effect on ground nesting birds. Uh, the thing with pine marten is pine marten are a protected mm -hmm. uh, native predator. So we, we don't remove them. There is occasions that we can get translocation licenses so that if you have uh, you have proven that there's a curly nest in a certain area, or say on an island, and that really would be a prime example, mm -hmm. and a pine marten swims out, um, I would apply it, and usually it would be granted a translocation latest, and you can move him. Um, you, can't, you can't kill them, or you can't harm them. Uh, in your day-to-day -day trap, and if it's just for mink, and you find when we use all life traps uh, because of bycatch. So, you know, occasionally you get a pine marten in it, even occasionally you get things like hedgehogs and woodcock and you know, funny things turning up, but they're all perfectly well alive. Um, so you have to check them within a 24 hour period every day, they have to be checked by law. So, um, so these things, but I mean, pine marten are protected. So there is, I, I'm not aware of any situation yet that have, somebody has got a kill license for a pine marten for any conservation program. But there's no point in saying that they don't have a negative effect. A pine marten will eat a young bird and eat an egg, um, you know, very, very swiftly. But they mean, so will badgers, so will hedgehogs, um, so will rats. So, so, I mean, you have to, you can't just come along and start annihilating everything. Is um, the pine marten then getting rid of the red squirrel or the grey squirrel? Yes, yeah, I mean, there's, so, there's nearly a proven correlation yeah. between, yeah, grey squirrel decline and pine marten increase. So, um, we, you know, there's, there's positives, I suppose, to everything. Invasive species and non-native species are sort of the ones that you can very, very safely remove because they shouldn't have been here. Mm -hmm. So they can have nothing but a negative effect really on, um, on biodiversity, on Irish biodiversity, because they wouldn't be here without human interference. Um, I mean, fox are, it is our big one. Foxes are, are so cunning and so clever and they're so good at what they do. If you have high proportions of foxes in an area, it is very, very, very hard for ground nesting birds to get fledglings away because they need, in, by, in, in general, approximately 30 days on eggs and approximately 35 days with chicks on the ground. So you have chicks that can fly either an egg stage or, or as small chicks for 60 plus days. And if you have a, a high population of foxes in that area, foxes, I've watched them, you know, I watch them all the time at night and they're just fantastic creatures, but they will quarter over and back over land like a dog hunt. And I mean, there's, it's very, very rare that within that 60 days, they won't have found that nest at some stage. Um, so, I mean, that's just, they're the realities of, of uh, you know, and it, it, when years and years ago, I suppose, before um, intensification of, of most of, of the industries such as agriculture and forestry and our peat extraction, um, there would have been more of a balance. So when you have a sizable population of something, they can absorb a certain amount of predation, mm -hmm. you know, X amount of their chicks, but they still get X amount away. When, you're, when your populations become so small, Every chick that you lose is, you know, is a bit of a blow to the population. So, um, so ground nesting birds. I suppose people would wonder why would a bird nest in the ground? You know, there's plenty of you know, there's trees and, and whatever else. As far as we know, ground nesting started after 
um, trees. So birds were nesting in trees far before they were nesting on the ground. Um, we think that the reason why they started then nesting on the ground was that there were some of these wide open spaces such as bogs, such as callow land that wouldn't have had forestry because it might have flooded for X amount of time of the year. Um, and when the when waters receded, it opened up these areas of land. So there was areas of land that weren't been utilized by birds or weren't been utilized in, in a, you know, in, in, in much of a way. So they then developed and they started fulfilling fish needs in this open landscape. So they started nesting on the ground. And when we look at these nests here, talk to duck and a red shank nest, you think they look very open and they look very, very vulnerable. But this, these eggs are actually this. This is the picture of it. Mm. So, I mean, I pulled back a little bit of grass to see these eggs. Mm. And this is actually droppings of the red shank as she flew off the nest. So it's in there. So over time, sometimes you will see with young birds having their, their first time, you know, they will lay out in very strange places right, right out in the open. And generally maybe their nest won't survive, but they will learn over time and then they will start talking eggs away. So I mean, it's, it's not like any bird flying over, you know, any hooded crow or buzzard flying over will just see them and, and swoop down and get them. They become clever over time. Um, so this niche of the, of the open landscape meant abundant food and probably le less competition that they started um, using it. Uh, it was important to mention too at the time, I suppose, when they developed doing this, there was a, a predator-prey relationship that was fairly well balanced. And as I mentioned already, they were getting enough fledglings away every year uh, to, keep their, to keep their population stable. Uh, most of the birds that we're talking about today are, are the ones that are under real pressure in Ireland would be waders, which um, are, you know, are our curlew and our snipe and our woodcock and stuff like that, and waterfowl, a lot of the waterfowl nests on the ground as well, particularly uh, susceptible to the like of mink, who would be very aquatic by nature. So, but they're all, they're ground nesters. You can occasionally get some ducks nesting in trees, all right, but the vast majority of them will nest on the ground. Um, and there's others as well, I mean, like skylarks and tippets and stuff. So I suppose we have our quick run through the species. And all these photographs were all taken on that free um, common term. A bird that travels huge distances to get here every year, nests on the ground. Um, obviously our mallard, uh, she obviously did all right before that photograph. Um, our curlew, these are probably some of the ubiquitous ones that we all know, and our oyster catcher. Um, oyster catcher are doing relatively well with, with probably eight to 10 pairs on that free. Um, and there are species, I mean, when I grew up, I'm not really fishing and, and bird watching, and I don't remember seeing oyster catchers that much. So I think they've done all right over the last uh, 20, or 20 or 30 years, and uh, they're certainly stable. Uh, let's see. But these are common scoter. These are a sea duck. Um, they breed in Loch Ree. Only a couple of places in Ireland that they breed. They're probably Ireland's rarest breeding duck, uh, I would imagine. So the female in front with the nice silvery cheeks, and the male is all black with a slight... Uh, yellow bib on the top of his beak. Um, but they spend most of their life at sea and they have a very strange um, life cycle. They, they will mate, the, the males will leave breeding ground very, very early. Uh, they mate the females and they leave. And females in a lot of instances will leave when ducklings are very, very young. Um, they, they, they will crush their ducklings in, in, together. Um, but a lot of females will then leave. So it's sort of hard to understand how the ducklings know where to go afterwards when they, when they mature, but a, a, a beautiful species, but fairly cryptic, hard to get a handle on. And there hasn't been much study done on the Irish breeding uh, common scoters. Uh, La Carib and La Brie would really be the two strong ones. Uh, Shoveler is another duck that we get breeding out there. Red Shank uh, breeds in, in good numbers. I mean, our Red Shank population in Ireland is, is disastrously poor uh, for, for a, a bird that used to be so common. Um, I think the latest estimates are that there's probably 250 or 300 breeding pairs in the country, you know, so um, Shannon Callows and Lockery is hugely important for them. There's pro probably approximately between the two places 100 breeding pairs, so we have a substantial amount of the, of the Irish breeding population. And back at the goals, um, people wouldn't realise it, but on, on a, you know, one time you'd see hundreds of them after a plough, in a, in a plough field and whatever, but they're actually doing badly. We still have good strong breeding uh, Numbers on Lockery, we would have um, breeding colonies with two or three thousand birds in them, uh, which are good, but they're also in decline. Uh, ring plover breeding on some of our bogs, and um, that one was a bog just a, a few hundred meters off the, off the well, it's on the Shannon Callows itself, it's a bog and it runs down in Southwest Common, so she got a chick away, that was the year before last. And then we had the like of Grebe, uh, Little Grebe, Great Crested Grebe. They're all ground nesting birds, all, all vulnerable to um, the same, you know, the general set of problems that the rest of them are, more hen, 
I ran out of course, which a lot of people don't know is the Irish national bird. Uh, I think it was voted as the Irish national bird sometime in the 80s. So the lapwing is now our national bird, uh, another bird that's doing very poorly. Um, I grew up in Drunk Town, which is a parish on the on the Shannon Callows, and I suppose when I was young and first getting into it, you know, you would see during the winter flocks of thousands, you know, of, of lapwing. Now I would see flocks of five, six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred would be big flocks, um, you know, whereas they would have been three, four, or five thousand, uh, you know, in, in the eighties and um, in the nineties. Uh, skylarks, meadow pipits, a <coughs> lot of birds that you know, birds that are, are sort of overlooked. But they all they all nest in the ground and they all I mean uh, uh, early mowing of silage or you know a, a lot of fox um, activity in an area will will destroy these the same as they will a curlew and this is a wind chat uh, that like, the Shannon Callows has a, has a strongish population of another bird that are in, is in serious decline a small bird that that. Uh, Winters in sub Saharan Africa, do you know, so it travels a long way to be here. So we sort of have a duty of care to a lot of these birds. Um, not really two, bottom two photographs aren't my own. <laughs> I mean, top two are the, as close as I got to them. So just so that you could see what they're like. But we had Marsh Harrier breeding in Not really, um the year before last. Uh, it was the first time, or, or maybe actually, no, in 2020, I think it was. So it was the first time with uh, recorded productivity for Marsh Harrier, I think since 1909 in Ireland. Um, subsequently, the male disappeared. He didn't come back the next year, or whatever happened to him, or wherever he went, and didn't show up last year either. And then this year, a male was back on territory with a female again. Um, I didn't get to prove productivity this year. I don't think they were successful. I didn't get to see enough of them uh, to, to confirm it. Uh, but as you can see, they're beautiful, beautiful birds, and they also nest in the ground. So, I mean, they can, they can be uh, susceptible to a lot of these problems as well. So the goals, I suppose, goals that we try and talk about are, are achievable outcomes. Uh, we can all make these goals that are, you know, non-achievable and that they, they don't do much good for us and they certainly don't do any good for the for the populations that we're trying to protect. So a lot really in general, would, it would be the ground nesting species that we've talked about and the water birds. Um, preservation and enhancement of habitat. La Cree and the callows in general would have some lovely habitat still left. So as I said earlier on, what, what we would trying to do is to protect that, to keep it as it is, and tweak it that we can get slight improvements. As I said, some of the islands that would have been lived in up until the 50s would have been farmed more intensively when there was families living on them. So since that, people were, had moved to the mainland for schooling and healthcare and whatever else, they would now be getting to say that they might still have livestock on them, but they wouldn't be out there all the time. They wouldn't have you know, vegetable gardens. They wouldn't have been sown any tillage. So as a result, the hedgerows are getting wider and wider in some areas and the scrub is encroaching out into some of the, the meadowland. So they would be things that we would have to watch for in, in, those, in, in those instances. And we're always trying to increase awareness, or well, I certainly am. Um, so that could be just chatting to a landowner that you meet them, chatting to somebody who's out fishing, chatting to somebody who's out shooting, um, and just trying to make people aware that um, <clears throat> these things are here. And, and I mean, water sports are becoming more popular, so you get people kayaking. And kayaking is a real sort of stop starting island hopping and from this and I mean people go in with the best intentions and sit down to have a picnic and they might realise they're right beside a nest. So a bird has left a nest and if they spend a couple of hours there, eggs might have cooled by the time they get back. And it's it's not they're not doing out of any harm, but they're doing out that they don't know. So the more we can increase awareness, the better. Uh, in my opinion, increase knowledge. Um one of the things that, that I believe in is that there's no such thing as single species conservation. And certainly uh, some of the, the contracts I do for the National Parks and Wildlife Service, the regional manager there, uh, Catherine Hannon, who's very supportive of a lot of these, she, she is also of the opinion that you know, if, if you're protecting one, you're always protecting something else. So focusing on just one particular species, in some instances is good, but it's nice to protect, try and, and get the habitat right, and then you're protecting all the species, because if the habitat is right, they will be there. Um, the importance of Lockery in general, I suppose, is, is fairly poorly known locally, where, where it should be known. It's on our doorstep and people don't realise, but there was a, a, um, an identification of breeding water bird hotspots in Ireland, a bit of a mouthful, uh, paper commissioned by the National Parks and Wildlife Service in 2020. And Lockery came out as the most important area in the country for breeding water birds. Uh, in water birds in that instance meant the water birds we talked about, the ducks, all those species, but also waders any of the birds that are heavily associated with water were included. 
uh, with the exception of Raptors, I suppose, if we had Marsh Harrier as well, we would have scored even better. But um, And the Shannon Callows is on that list as well. So the Shannon Callows is also recognised as an area that, that's important for, the, for all these birds. Um, and these were the recommendations, and I suppose it's backing up what we're trying to say. The recommendations were develop breeding water birds a sites register that we know what we have. It's very hard to implement change if you don't have data from what has been before. Um, if, if you're trying to explain to somebody or, or trying to secure funding for a project to deal with the decline in a bird number, if you don't have solid statistics for what the numbers were, and uh, you know the people who are deciding on these budgets are you know we don't have we don't have enough data to make a decision on it. Or at least if you can say there was three hundred breeding pairs or whatever species, now there's fifty. You can tell them the percentage decline and the decline over time. And um, so it's very important. And this this ties in then with developing survey and monitoring and data collection protocols that are the same year on year. That your your data is substantial and your data your data can be can be obviously anything can be questioned. But it will it will stand up to scrutiny basically is what you're trying to do, um, and then develop and implement site survey programs, um, so that you have individual programs for some for all these important areas, and that everybody knows what they're doing. I suppose that we're we're all driving towards the same the same thing. So we did up signs. These signs are on any of the uh, the facilities for launching boats on Loch Ree, and these are the sort of things I suppose that increase people's knowledge. If if they stand out a little bit, people will stop while they're launching a boat and have a quick read of it. Um, it also might tweak interest in somebody. So that you know, there's only so much you can put on a sign, but if they see lots of birds and they have lots of information on it, they might go back and do a little bit of research afterwards. And I suppose in this day and age, an awful lot of this material is available online if somebody has the has the appetite to go looking for it. So it just basically outlines Loch Ree. It is a, a special protection area for birds. <coughs> and when we did up the sign, we had 13 uh, threatened rare migratory uh, bird species. Um, so 21 were red listed and 43 of the amber listed species occur at some part of the year on Loch Ree. So it's a huge percentage of the birds that are on the red and amber list, considering the fact that we don't get seabirds by, by and large. So I mean, any of the bird, you know, seabirds such as puffins, etc., that are, uh, marine only razor bills and guillemots that might be on some of these lists, they're not going to be on Loch Ree. So when you take them out of it, we have a huge, huge percentage of the birds that are that are available to us. Um, so I suppose what we would talk about now is the uh, is the pressures that these that these birds are under, and it stems from habitat. Uh, the habitat is not the same, our, our landscape is not the same as it was 100 years ago. Um, and probably 100 years ago, early 1900s or mid 1800s, uh, biodiversity was probably at its height. Um, we had cleared probably a lot of woodland, but there were still pockets of woodland there. So you would have had woodland-based uh, species. We also then had um, our wetlands and whatever weren't drained because we didn't have machinery to do it. You know, a lot of these things were done by hand, which would have had minimal effect on them. So we had substantial uh, wetlands. We had some, our rivers were very pristine. Our water quality was very good. And our farming was very low intensity. So a lot of our grasslands, because we didn't have artificial manures, um, we didn't spread slurry like we would now because we didn't have slatted houses. You know, the, the lads would have been forking out um, farm air manure, manure, which would have had no real impact on water quality, etc. So our habitat is basically what has changed. Um, and as a result, our interaction with, the, with, with our environment has changed. So we're doing things in, in, different, in different ways. Um, and it has altered our ecosystems. So that the, the things that some of these species rely on to survive aren't there, or some part of their life cycle has been broken, such as birds that are long-lived, but they're failing to get chicks away. So that part of their life cycle, that they used to get a certain percentage of their, of their um, fledgings away. And I mean, for example, for the lake of Curlew, it's around 0.43 chicks per pair that we need per year out of our birds to stabilize our population. So basically, every two pairs in the country must get away one chick for to keep our population as it is. Um, obviously, we'd like to increase it. So if you could get on average one chick per pair, so that if three pairs failed, one one pair got away with three chicks, you would you would over time and, and fairly quickly would see a substantial increase in the population. But just to try and get that to happen is actually far harder to do than than we think. Um, in the Loch, Loch Ree context, context and the Shannon Callows context, we have been lucky insofar as our island sites and a lot of our callow farmland 
has not been subject to agricultural intensification because with the cows, because it floods. So you can't do some of the, the more modern things that we see landowners and farmers doing. The big one being silage. Um, silage has become the main fodder crop for cattle as opposed to hay. Hay, as we know, was saved, meadows were mowing in late summer. At that stage, the vast majority of the birds that were using that area, ground nesting birds, had, had got their chicks, had nested in April, say, and eggs hatched in May, chicks were on the ground during May into June, and the chicks fledged and flew off. Or if, even if they were still in the meadow, when a machine came in to mow, they could fly off. Now with silage, we're mowing silage in April, um, May, and these birds are still nesting. So we're, we're, it, is, it is not giving them a chance to, um, to get fledglings um, into the air. Um, our, our agricultural intensification obviously also affects other things. We see whole scale drainage of land, um, which affects all the invertebrates, all the plant species, etc. And for a lot of these uh, ground nesting birds that are water based, obviously it's removing pockets of valuable habitat that they would have bred in. Um, Commercial peat extraction is another big one. Ireland, I suppose, uh, traditionally during the during the nineteen hundreds, we started off with Ireland Russia, which is hydro. I think it was it was supplying nearly one hundred percent of our needs when it opened in nineteen twenty nine, and we went on then and started using peat in some of our, our peat fire uh, fire stations from the nineteen forties and nineteen fifties. I think. Um, so obviously, as a country to progress and develop, we needed to do this um, at the time. But it, it doesn't take away from the fact that we decimated thousands and thousands of hectares of, of bog um, in doing so. So we removed all the layer of vegetation, we drained them substantially, and we removed the peat, which had taken thousands of years to build up. So um, it had a very negative effect on a lot of these birds and a lot of those species. And in effect, both these things have affected our water quality. And not only, I don't just blame farmer, I don't just blame board and owner or whatever else, we're all uh, guilty of it. If you go into a garden centre, into a co-op or a creamery, and wait there a few minutes. It won't be long until you'll see somebody coming in buying Roundup or buying weed killers or whatever. We spray it liberally around our houses and whatever else. It all gets into our water system. I mean, they've, they've done loads and loads of tests now. I think every water source in Ireland has, has tested positive for glyphosate or, or, or small small quantities of active ingredients in in, um, in weed killers and pesticides and herbicides. So, I mean, as, as generally, we have to change our patterns of behavior to do to you know to address these things. Ireland should have absolutely pristine water quality. Do you know the amount of rain we get? Our water should be just second to none. And if they were, there would be another a knock-on effect in tourism and whatever else. Instead of looking out at getting huge algal blooms, poisonous blooms in our lakes because of eutrophication. And by eutrophication I mean it's it's increased nitrogen usually in our water courses that causes plants to a, 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 an explosion of, of these algal plants. Nitrogen should be in our water in very, very tiny amounts. You know, any, any sort of large amounts of nitrogen, they're not naturally supposed to be there. So they upset the balance. Um, forestry is another one. And, and thankfully, you know, Loch I suppose, and, and South Coast Common and the Callows hasn't suffered in the same way. But we get a mon monocultural um, system of Sika spruce plantations in Ireland. And I mean, Leitrim has been very hard hit by it. And in certain parts are as common. Um, generally, the areas that we have planted forestry on are, are areas that affect a lot of these birds that we've just talked about because it's marginal land, it's land that people don't think is as valuable as good agricultural land. So we stick the trees down there, you know, and they'll dig drainage and they'll put them in. And along with forestry comes the use of an awful lot of herbicides as well to try and get them in their early years to get the, the pine to grow and everything else to die. Um, so it's another thing that has put a lot of pressure on a lot of these uh, species. With Loch Ree, not so much in the callows, not, not as much, but it's something we need to be um, aware of. And predation. Um, we believe that there is a fairly large increase in predation events um, because of, I suppose, the lake of mink, because of high fox populations, but because of a lot of these predators are, are what we call generalist or opportunistic. So they can survive from a lot of different food sources. So say for a grey crow, I mean, you would see certain grey crows and they will they will feed on eggs during the nesting season. You would see trees that they use, and there will literally be hundreds of eggs underneath them that they'll eat. So they go around, they, they'll sit on treetops and they'll wait. They'll watch birds going in and out, they'll follow them down and they'll take eggs or chicks. Um, so they're opportunistic because they can also go off and feed on other things. Uh, foxes are just the supreme, you know, 
huge, clever uh, predator. They're, they're, you know, I mean, humans have tried to eradicate foxes from Ireland for hundreds of years and have failed, uh, thankfully. So it just goes to show how clever and, how, and you know, how good they are at what they do. Um, and the problem is when our species, when the population of these species get so low, the predation events become uh, more catastrophic because you have such a low population. If you only have 130 pairs of curlew in the country, you know, and you're losing 80 or 90 pairs nests to predation every year, it's, you know, it's unsustainable. Um, and development and recreation is one that we have to talk about in, 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 as regards pressure because we keep building, I suppose, in, in areas, we keep filling land, we keep uh, drainage, you know, drainage continues, anything that's developed, I suppose, from a building point of view, it can't happen on very wet grounds, it has to be drained. And recreation, um, the like of our recreation and our ability to spend money on recreation has increased. So some of these areas that were very quiet, you know, now you would get jet skis coming in, that they, they wouldn't have been there before. Um, People can say, oh, what does he have against jet skis? But I mean, there's no point in not talking about these things because they cause disturbance. If you cause disturbance, a one-off event, it's not too bad. But if it's disturbance after disturbance after disturbance, it has a, it has a problem. And I mean, recreation is, is listed as a you know, third or fourth in the list of pressures on a lot of these birds. So it's very high up there. And it, it's sort of brushed over quite a bit because recreation and tourism go hand in hand. Um, but it must be talked about. In my opinion, so there's a nice uh, scene, the complaint scene. So our methodology for implementing uh, conservation measures was a survey, as I touched on earlier. If you don't know what's there, it's very hard to implement meaningful change to try and protect them. So you need solid, solid data on what's there. Tracking then, um, there are some new adva and advances in tracking, so you, that you can keep an eye on some of these birds because they're very cryptic. And you see curlews or snipe or some of these things nesting, very hard to know where they're nesting, you know, they're in the area, but finding their nest so you can protect their nest is very, very difficult and very challenging, especially if you have small numbers of people on the ground. Uh, nest protection and predation management and invasive species management um, sort of go hand in hand. Um, habitat improvement and rehabilitation, we, we talk a little bit about that, uh, various different things that, that we do, but these methodologies are sort of, um, I, I, this is just to give you an idea of, of surveying. Um, this is data that you would build up over time by, by taking points. Now we have apps and we can do it, but I mean, generally it would have been done, you would have printed out your map before going out into the field and we're marking these down. And as you go day after day and spend hour after hour, you can see where you're consistently seeing birds and seeing what they're doing. And each of these drop pins might have a note attached to say feeding or say it flew in, didn't see it again or whatever else. And it's trying to build up information about where the birds are. And the numbers that are there, um, it, it 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 involves long hours in the field, it, you know, early hours and late hours because birds are more active, um, in early morning and in the evenings. So, but it's very very necessary to establish the, the species presence, um, and the other thing then is to their abundance because if we don't know their numbers, we don't know whether they're increasing or declining over time. Um, also useful, obviously, for locating of, of feeding, roosting, and nesting areas. So we can protect nests, and we can do very well at that. But if we focus on it solely, and something happens to a, a very, very valuable feeding area nearby, they're hand in hand. If the bird has nowhere to feed, it can't nest in an area. Um, it's the same, even re removing breeding from it. A lot of these birds that are migratory birds, uh, there's feeding areas, and if you keep chipping away at where they can go and removing them. You're, you're narrowing them up, you're removing these feeding areas and resting areas, and it has a dramatic effect on, on populations. Um, surveying can be done by a couple of different, you know, a few different ways. A vantage point is where you sit in a particular spot quietly and watch what comes and goes. You can walk over land, so you could do cross sections of this um, and note where birds fly from and where they fly to as you walk. Occasionally people use lower tapes, which would, would emit a call and that would be like the species that you're surveying for and you would see for a reaction. Not one that I'm, that I'm overly uh, keen on because it, it does cause some disturbance. Uh, you can get birds flying up into the air that should be on their nest because they've heard a, a lower tip, you know. But I suppose it, it can also happen if you walk over. So there's, there's downsides to some of these things, but you try and do it in, in as least an intrusive uh, way as possible. Um, <clears throat> What about uh, just recording the calls when you're out in the field then to try and get yeah, yeah, I mean, a you sense can, of what's there? Yeah, and... yeah, I mean, calls are, it, it's, it's vital, I suppose, to be, to be 
thoroughly good at your work that you must be familiar with, with their calls and different calls birds would emit different calls at different times it's like Carly would have a chick call and it's now right it's now it would be taken as if, if you heard it, the chick call that there was chicks on the ground you don't actually have to see the chicks um, because they only do that call when there's chicks on the ground to keep in contact with their chicks so there's various different things so it's very I mean it's, it's vital that you're aware and, and calls are, are a lot of the time are all you will hear or, you know you won't actually see birds so if, you, if you're walking around and you don't recognize the calls, it's obviously a downside in the data that you're collecting. So you will generally plot out your area and you will, you know, so that if you're talking to somebody and you're handing data over to them, you can say plot 22 or subsection 22 or whatever it is. So you're sitting down, you have your binoculars and you're watching. So this is an example, say, of common scoter in 22 or in a certain area of the lake. So I would have taken all of these points, uh, that the outline beside them would be the numbers that you would have seen at the different points. Uh, in the app itself, then you can click into it, and then it, it, I would have recorded information about what they were doing and where you know where the rent are, whether they were feeding or whether they were just resting and whatever else. So you can see it builds up a nice picture over time. That data then is there for everybody to see. If somebody needs to access data from twenty twenty two and it's now twenty twenty seven, they will know that it's there. And if this work continues year on year, you will see whether that declines or increases. Um, so that's the that's the potential of it, and this. Um, another way we, we, we do this is by ringing birds at the breeding sites. So it's catching young birds before they can fly. Generally, there's other ways of doing it. You can miss net adults, all right, and catch adult birds. But generally, for this purpose, this is a young S or blackback bull. Um, and uh, this would be part of tracking. So you're trying to keep, a, keep an eye on where these birds go to, which birds come back, as opposed to just seeing a bird you don't know what it is. Once they're ring marked, if you, can get, if you can get close enough, if you can get binoculars or a telescope on them to see, you then know what bird it is and you know the, 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 the information that goes with it. So it's relatively new. Um, I suppose our first tracking was an interesting story about a stork in Germany in 1822 and was caught by hunters and it had an arrow in it and they knew it was a strange looking arrow. But it was sort of the first time that they realised, I don't know, they brought it to some museum, but it was from some tribe in Africa. It was a particular type, so he he had migrated with the Arab. Obviously, it wasn't lethal; it was up through his shoulder or something. So it was the first time that we started to realize people obviously knew Starks left Germany, uh, but they didn't know where they went. Mm. But this started when, and it got people thinking, I suppose. And, and ringing really started in the early nineteen hundreds. Uh, radio tracking then was another thing that put radio transmitters on them, and there was various documentaries done, I think, on condors and some of these. Um, birds with, with radio trackers that were going around with the, with the parabolic dishes trying to find them. Um, and there's GPS units now, I suppose, which are subsidying all of these. You know, when you get a GPS unit onto a bird, you know exactly where they are for, for uh, every minute of the day. And I mean, this is a, a, a lesser black, or a black-headed gold breeding collie in the day. So you can see there are hives of activity with birds coming and going. And in 2018, it started a, a ringing program on Loch Ree. We'll give a brief outline of some of the results on it, because it's interesting. It just goes to show how this sort of work ties into conservation. Um, <clears throat> so there was 289 lesser blackback chicks ringed, um, and they got a lot of, a lot of reciting since, which sort of makes us think that the birds that are, are, are fledging in Lachree are generally doing fairly well, because we're seeing them, you know, they're not, uh, there's obviously mortality after you ring them, because young birds would have high mortality anyway. So if you're seeing a lot of recitings of your birds, you can sort of assume that your mortality rates are fairly low. Um, also, 10 great black bat golds have been, have been ringed, but there you can see a very clearly marked in them. So he has an individual number, 300 R. Um, in 2018, 300 R was the last chick ringed on Loch Ree on the 28th of June, um, 2018. And this is him on the 21st of September, 2018, in Portugal. So on that, on that date in June, he couldn't fly. We walked up and, and picked him up. Um, Two and a half months later, he's in Portugal after you know getting there of his own steam. So it's quite remarkable. I mean, if if, if you said that to somebody about the proof, they'd be saying, "Ah, you know, yeah, you sure you're not pulling our leg?" You know, it was a different bird. But like, this is you know, there, there's this is proof uh, positive of what happens. And I mean, we built up lots of information. This is Brian Burke. He's actually our common man as well. Brian works for Birdwatch Ireland, so Brian runs this program. Um, most of the time I'm just uh, chauffeuring them out and back in the boat and giving a, giving a help out but um, uh, this one Inch McDermott is a big lesser black bag colony on, on the lake so the 29th of June 2020 and he was photographed 38 days later in Spain so I couldn't fly 28 days got to Spain uh, in the space of, of a month or a week 
So, um, I, I mean, I just find it remarkable. Uh, this is a lesser black or a black headed gull that I photographed um, on the callows. So, sent in the information, and this is sort of what you get back. So, I, I cited him on the 26th of the 4th, 2023, um, and he had been ringed on Loch Ree on King's Island on, in 2021 as a chick. He was also had been seen in Dundalk in, in the meantime. So this man, Tom Cooney, had seen him in Dundalk. The dock. So you're building up information about where these birds go to, where they spend their time. Um, and also then, on, as, uh, over time, I suppose, the number of recitings, the number of birds you're getting back, you can build up how your other population is doing. Um, this is a GPS unit um, that uh, you would attach to birds. And this would feed back information you know, well, as often as you want it to read, but there's a solar panel on it to keep it charged. So you probably, every hour or in certain instances, if you want it to last a bit longer, uh, a couple of times a day, um, but it will send back, you know, within a foot of where that bird is. Um, in this situation, the reason why it's in my hand is because it fell off. <laughs> so, um, but we still got a lot of information about that bird prior to that happening. Um, and it's become possible as technology has developed that, that we can get things smaller. So there's, there's sort of a, a, an ethical weight to the size of bird that they can, it, it's been proven over studies that they can carry around without having any negative, negative effects. So that if they're on migration, um, we know that a large bird can carry X amount of grams without having any, any problem. Um, and they're, they're down now to the stage that they're only 2.7 grams and they will get lighter again over time, I've no doubt. They're solar powered um, and it's allowing us to put stuff on small birds now as well. So. This is another way of, of, of catching birds to, in, in, with, with curlew. One of the big problems we were having was finding their nests. They're extremely cryptic. They won't land in on top of a nest in a lot of situations. They'll land up to a mile away and walk in along through heather and, and grass. So, I mean, you can see them land in here, but then they're, you're unsighted. You can't see where they go. So they could go any direction from there for any sort of length. So, I mean, it takes an awful, it's very, very hard to find them. Um, and this year, and last year, last year was the first year where we started a head starting program with Curlew, uh, funded by the National Parks and Wildlife Service, uh, in conjunction with Fall Island. Um, so they're actually collecting eggs. Uh, so when, when birds are going down with their first clutch, they will be collected, and then they will re relay and have a second clutch. And those four eggs, or three eggs, will be taken to Fall Island, and they will be hatched on, in an incubator. The birds will be reared until their fledgings and will be released. So it, it's... It's trying to get over this break in the life cycle that we're, that we're failing to bridge so far. It's, it's getting fledglings that they can fly. Mm -hmm. um, so this is called a cannon net. So these are the two cannons. They're dug down into the ground um, and explosive charges put into them. So this is us setting out the, on a, on a ball and grade as well, setting out the, the net. Um, a dummy, a decoy stuffed curlew from the old days when you could hunt curlews. It was a stuffed curlew knocking around. So he's put out as a decoy. And a, and a lower tape is played. Uh, the male then will react. The male will be territorial at this time of the year. The male will, re will react and play down to see why there's another curlew in his territory. Um, the kind of net then is shot over. And I mean, it's been done so, so much that we know that the risk to the bird itself is very, very, very small. It's negligible. This is Alan Walsh. Alan Walsh has been, has been cannon netting in Ireland for oh, years and years, um, mainly on green and white fronted geese. He's, he's done nearly the most research of, on, on Greenland white fronted geese uh, in the world, I would say. Um, so very, very ill. And you can see that the curlew is sitting there. They put a little hood over its head. It sits there very, very quietly. They're only there for a few minutes. There's a couple of feathers taken out and a little ball patch made, and it's actually glue down to super glue. These transmitters will fall off. They're also leg ringed at the same time. Um, and we can just see there a close up of how beautiful they are. Um, and that's, that's a male. Um, and this is within the first day we got back this information. So we can see where he started from. He flew over and back here. He was going up on the high bank feeding. He was back around. There's a bit of a road here. Um, within the space of, of three or four days, this is what we got back. And we can see, you know, doing a lot of moving around here, feeding, feeding, feeding up along, but it kept returning to the exact same spot. So an investigation, there was a nest found there, you know. So, I mean, that would have been, that would have taken unless you were lucky, a huge amount of man hours to try and nail that down. Mm -hmm. I know it took time and effort to get the, the transmitter on it in the first place, but you could then go off and do other things and maybe put transmitters on other birds without having somebody, you know, sitting here for hours on end, day on day, because you know, a lot of these projects just can't afford to do that. Um, 
very, very interesting. Another thing that if somebody told me, I would have said they're mad. One morning he decided to fly off and he left the bog at Ray's well. Flew up onto Lac Reeve, stopped on Nuns Island in Lac Reeve, feeding for a while, and then went up to visit his friends at the Black Islands. The Black Islands had had four or five pairs of cardio and spent a bit of time there and just flew back again. Mm-hmm. Why? No idea. So does it mean that he was a bird that originally maybe bred in the Black Islands? Is that where he's from? Um, we don't know. But like remarkable stuff. This is only in the last uh, two years in, in Ireland that we're getting this information back. Um, where they roost, roosting sites, they, they swap over at, at nesting time that we knew. But now we can sort of start getting down how much time does the male spend on the nest? Is it equal? Is it, or do they do 12 hour shifts each? Do they change after eight hours? So a lot of this stuff um, is all just coming to, you know, we're, we're building knowledge all the time. Um, and that was him. You can even zoom in down to the down to the detail. This is Nuns Island and Lock Reed. It's the harbour and the, the point that sticks out. It's a back of the gold colony. But he spent a bit of time there probably feeding in among the rocks and whatever and headed off. Um, so I suppose the next part of it is, is suitable conditions for a lot of these birds vary uh, depending on, on, on what species or, or, or what protection you're trying, what you're trying to protect, I suppose what I'm trying to say. But in this instance, this sort of area, this is Calf Island of the Callows. So you can see this is early in the year, very, very open with not a, not a great cover of grass. And we can see this ground is soft. So these birds would have a lot of probing that they can do for insects, a lot of feeding, the ducks, there'll be little pools of water. Um, it's also open so that they can see a lot of these birds, their defense mechanism is seeing a predator coming, seeing danger. So they will set down, they're very well camouflaged. So when they're sitting still, it's hard to see them from above, but they can see. So if they see something coming, some birds decide to sit tight and won't move at all. Um, you know, probably all of us walks in the country, a, a, a snipe or a pheasant or something will flow up from under our feet, you know, and, and frighten the life out of you. Or other birds then will sneak off a nest, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll sneak off and up, up through tufts of grass and they'll fly off from somewhere up here. Um, or other birds, you know, will feign injury to get you to drag you away. But they will see you coming is, is, the, is the main thing. Or, or open bogs, um, open lake shore. And these are all, these are all uh, habitats that we were looking for in this area. And, and some of the work then involves actually getting in on the ground and getting a machine. This is a wader scrape. So what we're trying to do in this instance is hold water. Um, because of drainage and intensification in various different places, you can get a lot of these areas that probably would have held water all year round. Um, now we're draining because you know there's runoff and there's drain. So you're trying to dig way, they're called scrapes. So they're, they're, they're low profile, but they will hold water all year. So that if the rest of the land starts drying out, there would still be a water source there for, for chicks and for adults, uh, somewhere to feed, somewhere to drink. Um, so it's habitat enhancement, I suppose. Um, Loch Ree, some of, of what we're trying to do is, is get rid of scrub encroachment. So we have these, these wide open areas um, such as this. And if you get over time and left that and there was very little grazing and very little activity, you'll get an odd little willow starting to grow up here or, you know, in some of the other areas, a blackthorn hedge and it'll tip along and next thing it'll be six foot wide, it'll be eight foot wide. And so it, it diminishes the, the habitat suitable for, for, these, uh, for these birds. Um, so that's our way their scrapes. Um, grazing management is a big one. Uh, what I always say to, to landowners and farmers, a lot of these species will not survive without agriculture. If you stop farming, they will, they will go because they're, they are co-dependent with agriculture. They depend on grazing um, for various different reasons, but the grass sward needs to be thin enough that it's not rank that their chicks can get through, uh, low enough at the start of the year that they can see and protect themselves from their nest. And also it grows as their eggs are hatching. So by the time their chicks are hatching, there's a little bit of growth around the boat and the chicks can forage away. It also obviously encourages insects and they're able to probe and, and, and feed themselves. So grazing is essential. So what you're trying to do is graze some, get, get people to farm in, in such a manner that you're not um, having huge livestock densities on these areas at the wrong time. But you're not having no grazing either. So you're trying to reduce your, you know, your livestock units while birds are on their nest in this area, that there's only maybe less than one livestock unit per hectare, say in say in for adult cattle. So very little grazing, 